<laughs> Mario Puzo's crime novel The Godfather was published in 1969 and details the story of a fictional mafia family headed by Don Vito Corleone. The novel covers the backstory of Vito from early childhood to his old age, including his passing of the torch to his youngest son Michael who inherits his throne. It was a huge success, as was the 1972 adaption directed by Francis Ford Coppola, starring Marlon Brando and Al Pacino. The film is considered one of the greatest ever made, and it has sparked a debate as to which is better, the book or the film. I've reviewed both on the channel and think they are both magnificent, but if I were to choose... Well, I think Puzo himself said it best in an interview where he essentially said both are great, but if you had to pick the 20 best films ever made, you would have to include The Godfather, and you can't necessarily say the same about the book. As fans know, Coppola insisted that the movie was called Mario Puzo's The Godfather, because the film was such a precise adaption of the book, and of course Puzo co-wrote the script. There's huge portions of the movie which are accurately lifted from the book, such as when Tessio asks to be let off the hook. It goes down in the movie pretty much exactly as it did in the novel. The Godfather film is one of those movies which is very similar to the book it's inspired by. That being said, there are many differences between the novel and the movie, which is what I wanted to discuss today. So let's take a look at some of the biggest differences between the Godfather novel and the Godfather film. In this video, I am not going to be referencing sequels to the Godfather book, which were not written by Puzo, such as The Godfather Returns, The Godfather's Revenge, and The Family Corleone. Number one, Lucy Mancini and her big problem. The Godfather can be a bit of a weird book at times. There's no better example than the character of Lucy Mancini, the woman who Sonny copulates with during Connie's wedding. In the canon of the films, she ends up giving birth to Vincent Corleone, the eventual Don and successor to Michael in The Godfather Part 3. There's no real way to sugarcoat this. One of the subplots of the book involves Mancini having a huge vagina, and Sonny, who has a really big dick, being the only man who can satisfy her, so big that it causes his wife problems and as a result she doesn't mind too much that he sleeps around with other women because it spares her the discomfort of Sonny's member. After Sonny dies, one of the real tragedies of the book is that Mancini no longer has anyone big enough to satisfy her and there is an entire chapter dedicated to her trying to achieve said satisfaction including being whirled off on a whirlwind romance with a surgeon who has her private area's walls tightened, after which the two engage in numerous passionate trysts. Seriously, I'm not making this up. Number 2. Johnny Fontaine Though he is a relatively minor character in the film, Johnny Fontaine has huge segments of the book dedicated to his life as a fading alcoholic actor. Legend has it that Fontaine was based on Frank Sinatra, and we spend a lot of time with Johnny and his childhood friend Nino. Johnny goes through several marriages and develops a sore throat, resulting in him being unable to sing for 10 minutes without his throat becoming hoarse. With his singing career looking bleak, Johnny turns to movies and has his eye on a war film which seems tailor-made for him, in that he would hardly have to act to play the role. His only issue was Hollywood producer Jack Waltz's refusal to let him be in the picture, as depicted in the film. The book goes into detail of the anxieties and issues of Johnny Fontaine, which mainly revolves around booze and women. The sexual escapades of Johnny are pretty vivid. I mean, the following is a direct extract from the book. All these Hollywood guys laughed at his fondness for virgins. They called it an old guinea taste, square, and look how long it took to make a virgin give you a blowjob with all the aggravation, and then they usually turned out to be a lousy piece of ass. But Johnny knew that it was how you handle a girl. You had to come on to her the right way, and then what could be greater than a girl who was tasting her first dick and loving it? Ah, it was so great breaking them in. Yeah, now that I think of it, the novel is pretty highly sexualized and feels like old Mario was really horny when he wrote it. Number 3. The Background of Waltz Speaking of Hollywood, Waltz and horniness, one detail the book divulges was that the Hollywood producer who ends up with his horse's head in his bed was an actual pedo. When Tom arrives to discuss Johnny Fontaine with Waltz, he notices a beautiful girl in the office with who he assumes was the girl's mother. Later, he sees the same girl and woman get into a limo with the girl looking noticeably more poorly, and Tom puts two and two together. 
This is actually referenced in a deleted scene in the film, and it's thought that this was removed from the final cut as it would have added an aura of righteousness to the horse in the bed action, making the Corleones look more heroic than they actually were. Number 4. The fate of Michael's other bodyguard, Callow. Callow, not Connie's husband Carlo, but one of the two of Michael's bodyguards in Sicily, the other being the traitor Fabrizio, is a relatively unremarkable character. There's not a lot to him, and we can assume that he is alive and well when Michael leaves Sicily to return to America. In the book, however, he is killed in the car explosion which kills Michael's wife. In fact, this makes it ever so slightly easier for Michael to secretly return back to the States, as the Corleone enemies think it was Michael that was killed, so they cease with their assassination attempts. Number 5. The Death of Fabrizio Sticking with the assassination attempt against Michael, the man who set it up was Fabrizio, the man trusted with the protection of Michael, who instead decided to betray him for the Corleone enemies, with the promise of his dream being fulfilled, that being him immigrating to the States. In the movie, we never see nor hear from Fabrizio again after the car explosion, but in the book, Michael gets his revenge on Fabrizio. In fact, his death occurs at the same time that all the other big deaths occur at the end of the book. Fabrizio now lives in America and works in a pizza parlour. He is approached in the store by an unknown Corleone goon, who shoots him, saying, Fabrizio, Michael Corleone sends you his regards. A similar scene was shot by Coppola, Though, using poetic justice, Fabrizio is killed with a car bomb. This scene is not included in the movie, though it does appear in extended versions of the film, though in the second film, not the first. There is also an alternate Fabrizio death scene, where Michael Corleone himself kills Fabrizio, though this scene has never been released and is thought to be lost. Number 6. Luca Brasi one of the more interesting supporting characters in the film is Vito Corleone's trusted enforcer, the intimidating Luca Brasi, who we first see practicing his congratulations to his Don on his daughter's wedding, and then the actual congratulations which he flubs. He is then tasked by Vito to keep an eye on Virgil Solozzo and spy on the workings of the Tatalia family. We see him prepare himself, arrive at a bar where he suggests to Solozzo and Bruno Tatalia that he might want to switch families, but is then killed immediately in vicious fashion. He's hardly in the film much, but leaves an impression thanks to the imposing stature of Lenny Montana, and the fact that there's just the odd feeling that there's more to this guy's story. Given the way people describe him in the film, you'd think he was a force to be reckoned with. Plus, even Don Vito himself seems uncomfortable around him. Ultimately though, he comes across as a rather slow and dim-witted oaf. In the book, however, things are very different. Though events play out similarly to the movie, the novel goes into Luca Brasi's past, in which Brasi forced a midwife at knife point to throw his own newborn baby into a furnace, and he then killed the child's mother. After being apprehended by the cops, Brasi tried to kill himself in his jail cell using a piece of glass, but failed, and when Don Corleone learned of these events, he had arrangements made for Luca to be released without charge, and utilised his services as the bulldog of the Corleone family. Luca Brasi was truly a monster in the book, and if you would like to know more, check out my video, The Horrifying Origin Story of Luca Brasi. Number 7. Al Neri since we've talked about Luca, we might as well discuss Al. Al Neri is not really a character that sticks out in the movie. He's notable for being in all three films, looking really cool, and being trusted with some of the most secret of tasks, such as the murder of Fredo Corleone. But really, he's just in the background of many scenes. In the book, however, just like with Luca Brasi, Al Neri may be just another supporting character, but an entire chapter is dedicated to his backstory as a former cop who was kicked off the force. The Corleones were looking for a replacement for Luca Brasi, and Vito and Michael discuss Al Neri in great detail, with him in the book not simply being just another enforcer, but someone ruthlessly loyal to Michael as Luca was to Vito. For a more detailed look at Al Neri's backstory, you can check out my video, The Brutal Origin Story of Al Neri. Number 8. The entire plot of the second and third film. It might interest you to know that Puzo's novel tackles pretty much everything we see in the first movie. Connie's wedding, the five family war, Michael in Sicily, the Corleone's revenge, and so on and so forth. The biggest omission, bigger than Lucy Mancini's private parts, is the youth and early years of Vito Corleone. 
This is of course used in the second film, with the movie's flashback segment. However, the 1950s storyline, that is, the story of Michael Corleone as boss of the family, does not come from the book, instead being written for the film by Puzo and Coppola. So that means in the book there's no Cuba, no Hyman Roth, no death of Fredo, basically nothing after the first film ends. And this extends to the third film also, none of which is in the book. Number 9. Fredo. Fredo is quite an interesting character, an enigma of sorts. He is a loyal follower of his father, but as there is already an older, more capable son, Fredo will never be destined for the throne. Even still, he has his duties and is a typical member of the Corleone family. Now, in the film, Fredo is of course thought to be weak and ineffective. He completely bottles protecting his father when Vito is shot, and rather than get help, he sits by the curb and cries. Vito doesn't even look at him when Fredo enters his room during Vito's recovery, and later in the movie, Vito expresses disappointment in his middle son. He simply does not possess the traits needed in the Corleone family, so is sent to Vegas to learn the casino business. The second movie doubles down on Fredo's weakness, with us learning he had pneumonia as a child, he harboured resentment for his brother Michael, and was foolish enough to get involved in a murder attempt against Michael. As mentioned, in the book, none of the events in the 1950s storyline of the second film happen, and interestingly, though it is mentioned Fredo lacks the animal force for leadership, the way I interpret the character in the book is that he was not at all weak, rather he was competent in his duties. It is the assassination attempt on Vito which actually changes him, and the family notice that after Vito is shot, Fredo loses his nerve, seldom talks, and becomes a shadow of his former self. You could take this interpretation from the film as well, although the second movie clearly shows Fredo was pretty weak-willed in the past too. The move to Vegas is supposed to be a second leash of life for Fredo, who clearly needs a change of scenery, but instead of making his father proud through his success via the Vegas way of life, Vito stops bringing Fredo up during family discussions, as he's angry with the way Fredo behaves out in Vegas. It's not made clear what this degenerate behaviour is until later in the book where it appears Fredo becomes a sexual tyrannosaurus and impregnated around 15 women, all of whom had abortions. Or as the movie puts it, banging cocktail waitresses two at a time. And finally, number 10, the structure. Though the movie is pretty faithful on a macro level and with specific scenes, the structure of both book and film are pretty different. Chapters dealing with the Corleone family will be intercut with chapters following Johnny Fontaine or Lucy Mancini. The climax of the book is put on the brakes to take a look at the past of Al Neri. Vita arranges for the return of Michael from Sicily to America, and then we take a look at what Michael got up to in the old country. The book also has a habit of ending a chapter with a shocking revelation like Vito arriving to The Undertaker with Sonny's dead body, with us not even knowing he had died, and the following chapter telling us how his death occurred. It might all sound random, but for the book, it works. But it would be pretty disorientating if the movie followed a similar structure. So there you have it, 10 differences between the Godfather novel and film. There's a lot more too, so if you want to see a sequel to this video, let me know in the comments below. Which changes made for the film did you think were for the best? Was there anything from the book you wish was put into the film? Have your say in the comments below, and thanks for watching. Before we finish, I'd just like to thank my patrons, Nicholas Curtis, Andre Millington, Daniel P and Countess Von Zarovich, and also my channel members, Michael Awatwi, Rikers, Damien Irving, The New On Guam 24, Lan Deng, Joe Grossberg and Cam Medina.